Hello, and welcome to Ontology Explained. I'm Casey Hart, philosopher and ontologist, and this is another new series. I feel like I've been starting a lot of new series lately, but I got a lot of fun ideas, uh, and this one comes from you. So this is my Ask Me Anything series, and rather than just do like a Reddit page where there's an AMA or something like that on, um, which who knows, maybe we'll do at some point in the future. Now I've been looking at so many comments in the YouTube comment section. I really appreciate them. And some of them I'm like, oh, I should do a video on that. So one of those is, is here today. Uh, shout out uh, also to Braden in part for giving this, me this idea. We were talking just the other day and her view was something like, hey, what's, you know, what do you like doing pedagogically? How do you think about teaching? I was like, oh, I'm a good teacher, especially in like a one-on-one -on -one relationship where I can kind of see how your face is changing. What do you want? Like, I, I like that interplay back and forth. And so I was thinking after that conversation, how can I get more of that? And one of those ways is to make content just directly in response to comments. So with that said, I'm just going more or less off the cuff here. I, I've made a couple of quick notes before this video, but let me read this user's comments and then give a response. So it comes from Fred Block 4308 and they say, hi, thanks for your nice videos. They give good insight. You're welcome. Uh, can you explain why you use a text editor where you need to know all the complex syntax? Also, how do you remember the graph relations when the entire ontology becomes bigger? And I think these are just two phenomenal questions that I wanted to just do a quick response. And I realized that it takes more than that. So here we go. Let's break it down into the two parts, right? The first part is about why use a text editor. So I use Emacs. Why am I in Emacs? Why is that the my choice for ontology development? And a bunch of different ways we can get into that. But I think the first one is just the history of it. So as a matter of course, how did I end up using Emacs as my personal IDE? And that goes back to PsyCore. So I became an ontologist when I took a job from Doug Lennett. Uh, at PsyCor, didn't know what it meant to be an ontologist. I just knew that uh, I wouldn't have to spend forever on the academic uh, hamster wheel trying to find a long-term tenure track position. And instead I'd go to Austin, Texas and they would pay me a better salary than I was gonna get as a postdoc somewhere. And when I was there, uh, they had some of their own like uh, software for how you were developing Psych, the ontology. But everything that they were doing programming wise under the covers was in Lisp and it was an Emacs Lisp. And so Emacs was the IDE that all of the programmers were using there. And not all the ontologists, in fact, I don't know, he was like half the ontologists or something like that actually did anything in Emacs. But I was like, well, I'm learning some new stuff. And there's some pretty sweet people here like, you know, Andrew Zipper uh, or, or Andrew Parisi, people who know how to program. And I just tried to ride their coattails and use the same IDE that they were using, ask them for tips on how I could also become a hacker someday. And I am not a hacker. Uh, but I can do a little bit of programming. And so I learned those tools in Emacs. So I adopted that. I created my own major modes or macros and we're just was doing the stuff in the text editor. And I found that that gave me some more control than using some of the other methods of adding stuff in. So at PsyCor in particular, when I was using the Psych browser, which is what we used as sort of our, you know, what you see is what you get, WYSIWYG editor, you could do things one at a time more easily there, but there was also a block that you could put in what was called KE text. And I found that if I could generate bigger chunks of KE text, I could do more ontology more quickly. And so that meant I was better off designing it just like in a text editor somewhere and then dumping in my output. And that allowed me to do some formulaic stuff, take things from spreadsheets, you know, apply some transformations, what have you. So. That's why I went into Emacs there. And then when you when I left PsyCore, I still had it. Like that was still, okay, well, it's free software. I'm a pretty cheap person. So if Emacs weren't a like free open source sort of thing, I probably would have dropped it for something else when I left. But I'm glad that I held on to it. So when I left PsyCore, then I wanted to learn how to program in OWLRDF. And I was still most comfortable using Emacs as my text editor and we did some other things in Emacs at that point. Org mode will take over your life. I'll talk more about being an Emacs person in a second. Uh, but uh, then I picked up Protege because that's how you want to learn to do OWLRDF stuff. And that taught me this, like that taught me how to put things together. But I always looked at the output from Protege 
in a turtle file and just sort of learned what the text output was. So part of uh, Fred's question here is like, okay, well, why didn't I adopt that other tooling? And so you've now got like the historical answer, like this is why I got into Emacs. But then I would have picked up a competitor if I thought they were any good. But like I've tried developing stuff in Top Braid. I've tried it was like what was it Top Braid Composer? I used Pool Party for a little bit to test that out. I used Protege. I just thought none of them were very good. Um, they have some nice visualizations. They allowed me to do some stuff, uh, but I never felt like they made me more capable than just using the text editor. And in fact, I thought they were often very clunky. I didn't like some things about the visualization. They ran a little bit slow. It just the, they never impressed me. And, uh, you know, apologies out there if you're someone who, you know, programmed any of those tools. I think they're really useful some, for some people. Some people like them. That's great. They, they just weren't for me. Um, and so this gets into, like, the broader concept of, like, why does anybody use the IDE that they use, right? So if you're a Vim person or you're a VS Code person or you're an Emacs person or you're a just, like, text edit plus kind of person, right? Like, why do you use that? I think you just, you get to be a fan of whatever like key combinations that you're used to using. You get to be a fan of that sort of visualization. And at some points, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks or something like that. And you're just, you're comfortable with what you're comfortable with. Uh, and so I, I became an Emacs guy and I never had a strong enough impetus to leave. Um, okay, that's that's kind of like an inertia argument and a little bit of a negative argument, but the positive argument about Emacs, I think, is also pretty strong. Emacs is freaking awesome. Uh, if you find somebody else who uses Emacs, just talk to them about it, and they will probably, well, if you have enough time, you can talk to them about it, but you're going to get evangelized too, right? People who use Emacs tend to love Emacs. It's one of those things like, if you're someone who drives a Jeep, Right. Or, you know, if you're in, in, in some other country where, where Jeeps are less prevalent, maybe there's another vehicle that's the same. But like there's this kind of nod where you see someone else driving a Jeep and you're just like, yeah, I got you. Right. That's what I feel like if you find someone else who's an Emacs user, uh, you, you immediately form a bond with them because like you're you're sort of a special crew that uses this. So what does Emacs have for it? Uh, it's open source. The documentation is really easy to find and really easy to follow. And it is infinitely customizable. Um, now, I'm not an expert programmer. I haven't spent a lot of time using VS Code or Vim or anything like that. So like more power to all of you. Maybe those ones are better. Fine. But in my experience, Emacs has allowed me to do all of the stuff that I've wanted. And when there's a procedure that I'm repeating over and over again, or a type of code that I want to be able to leverage or a type of file that I want to view and make a customizable viewer for, I've been able to do it in Emacs. Uh, and I've been able to find somebody else who has either like built a mode already or built the start of a mode that I can customize for me. Uh, and so when I create a new turtle file, like I can just use my turtle mode and create a new turtle file just like fast. And like that's that's super slick. Um, in fact, yeah, let's go. Let's see here. What's the camera? All right, here I am. Uh, here are my notes. Uh, we're, we're here on Emacs is awesome. I'm espousing its uh, virtues. Um, actually, I should make it a little bit bigger. Uh, and then the next part, which will sort of be tied into this, is like using Emacs and coding this way. Like, I just found it to be really fun. Uh, and so, um, you know, not everything has to be like this is, has a real tangible, practical benefit. Sometimes you're just having a good time and you want to do coding here. I really like how simple uh, Emacs and Elisp is for like creating lists and you know taking the first or rest elements and breaking them down. I've done little games uh, where I teach my daughters how to do some programming in it. It's just it's a good time. Uh, but what I was getting at here, like if I want to start a new file, right? Um, so let's just go desktop temp um, testing .ttl, and I go turtle mode, uh, and then I go create turtle file and I can just go off the top blah all right sweet so now I've got my new building block for creating a new ontology right um, it doesn't take very long why because I've done this procedure enough times that it made sense for me to understand it and create a macro that will start a new turtle file and I go from there and then if I want to create some new class right I can say create a new class and this is Casey's favorite class 
and it's a subclass of owl thing and I'm not going to give it lexical and then I create this which has my example instance and subclass terminology right so there's like once you've built enough things and create the macros and create the space not only do I really enjoy it and think it gives me the tools to do what I want to do also I get more and more locked into it right if at some point I wanted to pivot out of this and do something in vim or vs code or whatever it would be a bigger cost because like now I got to create new files from scratch and like all of my tooling and macros that I want, I've got to port over and ugh, I, I don't want to take the time to do that. Okay, so that's Emacs. Historically, I got into it. Uh, I thought all the competitors were pretty terrible. If you want to design some new competitors or something like that, that you think are really good, or if you've used one that you really like, throw them at me. I'm more than happy to look at some of them. Um, but Emacs, I think is pretty darn cool and I enjoy using it. So, um, you know, don't, don't quit while you're having fun. Right. Okay. On to the next topic. I'll go ahead and make my camera bigger here again. Uh, how do you remember vocabulary when the graph gets really big? Um, and remember is in, is in scare quotes here, right? So some of it's in my head and I got a number of things to talk about here, but first I want to say this is a insightful and really important question. When I talk about what ontologies are, one of the important points is that an ontology is a language and a language is only as good as, uh, people being able to use that language. So can you put your data in it? Can people query it? Can people converse in it? And if you can't remember the vocabulary, then you've built a bad language. So I think it's a really insightful question to say, all right, if I'm making a bigger and more intense ontology, how can I keep it usable and memorable? Uh, so series of things that came to mind here. I'm sure there are more. This is a little bit, you know, stream of consciousness. I took 30 seconds and jotted some, some thoughts down. First, it's use it or lose it. So if we think of it like a language, look, we you can learn French, right? Uh, you can learn Japanese. I took Japanese in high school. I can say things uh, that like, you know, uh, shizuke, shizuke, wait, shizuke kudasai is like, shut up, please, or something like that, right? Uh, and I know sono hanashi o shiteita because I remember there's an exchange student and I asked them, how can you say that's what I'm talking about? Because at the time, I thought it would be really cool. I had to like learn how to say all of the things that the sports center anchors were saying. And that is pretty much all that is ha has stuck with me uh, over the years. Uh, uh, apologies, Prudence Sensei, uh, you are a fantastic teacher, but I just don't use it, right? I don't regularly speak Japanese or read Japanese. And so there are a bunch of cobwebs. It's dusty. I don't recall call it. Same goes for your ontology. If you build the language and you're not regularly using the language or looking at it, then you're not going to remember it. Uh, so build something. One, it says use it, but two, build something that you are going to or want to use, because if that's not there, then, uh, you know, uh, you, you need to get the adoption to be part of the remembering it. Second aspect to how you can remember the vocabulary when it gets really big, and this comes to strategic design of the ontology. You can build it in ways that are going to make it easier to remember. And here I'm going to introduce you to a like a dispute that I have with Dave McComb uh, and myself. It's not like a super, you know, uh, acrimonious dispute, but like he has this philosophy. So Dave McComb at Semantic Arts has this approach that your ontology can only have X number of terms in it. I forget how many is like 120 terms or something like that. And so that's why when they build GIST, they only have so many classes and named individuals and properties in it because he thinks if you're going to learn it, you're, the human mind can only grok so much. And so you need to keep it contained into a certain number of terms. I think that's definitely a way that you can go. So if you want to build an ontology that is understandable and easy to remember, then you might just say, I'm going to max out at a certain number of terms, and that's going to make it easy or easy enough for me to remember it. I don't take that view. Instead, I think make as many terms as you like. But, and this is the big caveat, the top level set of terms can't be too big. So what do I what do I mean by that? Let me do another here. Let me pop back over and share my screen. So if we go over here and you look at uh, this is what we were maybe seeing the other day if you're watching my chess ontology videos. So you can see here that we have only this many top level classes, right? In the way things are set up now, like time interval, unit, place, situation. Now there are a bunch of terms here. What's the expansion? Is it like alt over? So like. If I expand this, we get a bunch more things, right? A whole bunch of stuff. 
But that doesn't mean that that's uh, that that's intractable, even if when you fully expand it, you get a million different terms. Because if you can have relatively few at the top level, then you know, look, there are maybe infinitely many expansions where like rabbit trails I could run down, but I can understand the big picture questions. So part of my answer then to this question from you, Fred, is you don't have to remember everything. You can make it so that you remember the big picture things and you could always drill down to the more specific notions later when you need them uh, and, and you want to pull them back. And I think that's like very similar to the way that we use English, right? So this is my other, I guess, sort of pushback to the Dave McComb kind of view, which is if the English language is viewed as, you know, a, a language and an ontology, a vocabulary and a model of our world, the English language got a ton of terms in it. That doesn't mean it's unusable, even if, though I don't know all of the terms in the English language. Instead, I know some more general terms. And if I learn a new term, right, like, ooh, you teach me defenestration, like that's a cool new uh, verb that I can use or, or, or gerund or whatever. Awesome. Uh, but I can express that in terms of other pieces of vocabulary or as an expansion of something else that I already know. Uh, and so then I can just continue to grow my understanding. So, uh, okay ontology design either make your ontology not too big so that you can remember it all or if you do make it very big structure it with like nested subclasses and sub properties so you can always remember the top level ones and then even if you forget the more specific ones you can learn them by drilling down into them uh, other use and i already showed this one uh, i use visualizers so how do i remember all the relations in the ontology sometimes i go look at it in protege uh, now, I said earlier that I use Emacs for my ontology development, but Protege is not a bad visualizer for looking at the hierarchical display of things. And I still do that regularly enough. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is one sub property of situation involves. Let me just run down and see what they all are. Right. Or, oh, this is somewhere unsigned. It's not it's an event. Uh, it's an event of moving something. What are my options there? And I'll just expand it. Alternatively, instead of using the visualizer, sometimes I just use Sparkle. So I load my ontology into a triple store and I write a query and I say, what are all the classes? And then I find, you know, or what are all the top level classes? And then what are all the subclasses of it, right? So I can use Sparkle queries that will allow me to pull out the information to find the vocabulary that I want. Uh, and then somewhere between Sparkle querying and then the, the last point here, which is on documentation uh, is I, I represent specific objects that use all the vocabulary that I've got. So for instance, in the chess ontology that I'm building in another video series here, I said a bunch of stuff about Magnus Carlsen, and I might say what his FIDE rating is. And so if I want to remember, oh, what's the vocabulary associated with that? We're like, what's all the vocabulary about chess players? I don't have to memorize the vocabulary. I can say, I know Magnus Carlsen is a data point in my ontology go look him up and see all the things that are said about him and then i can find the vocabulary that i need right so you can think of this like if you're trying to learn a, a new language or something like that like read books right and then you can figure out okay well like i went and read the count of monte cristo uh and, and i read that in french and that helps me understand french better because i can see how words function in context so i'm not learning my vocabulary or memorizing it by memorizing the dictionary i'm reading specific uses of that language and that helps me understand it in context and it also reminds me that like oh if i want to learn that again later or rediscover it i can go pull that book off the shelf and remember how they were, you know, discussing uh, uh, the length of his nose or, or something like that to, to get some information. Okay, uh, beautiful. So again, thank you to Fred uh, um, and thank you to others who have participated in the comments section. I'm going to try and make this a more regular thing. So if you've got any great questions, drop them below on this video, drop them below on any of the videos. I the channel is growing, but it's not so big that I don't read all of the comments. So I read them all. Uh, if you've got a good question for me that I feel like I can't respond, you know, quickly or completely enough to, uh, I would love to to take it and make make another video on this. And then I'm giving people what they want. I'm responding to your specific needs, uh, and yeah, that makes it easier on me too in deciding what kind of material to cover next. So thanks again, Fred. Hope you guys enjoyed this and learned stuff from it. And uh, I will see you again very soon.